We are looking at the Philokalia, and uh, we are finally today at controlling the passions. We start with repentance, we develop a life of prayer, and as we develop a life of prayer, God shows us things in our lives that need improvement. And it's going to be a different struggle, albeit somewhat similar, perhaps. It's going to be a different struggle for you than it is for me, than it is for your neighbor, than it is even for our own wives and children. St. Paul talks about working out our salvation with great fear and trembling. Christianity is unique in that each of us comes to the Lord having had our individual experiences that have shaped our lives particular ways. And we are coming from a place that is unique compared to anybody else. Uh, in the world, and we are therefore working through things that are unique to anyone else in the world. And yet there are tremendous similarities in how we work through those things. There are tremendous similarities in, in, in the methods that we use to, for example, subdue anger uh, and, and what have you. Western theologians have a tendency to look at our nature as being totally depraved. This is not uh, the Eastern theology at all. We have to assume that our true nature is given to us by God. That is to say, we have that element of divinity within us. It's been marked and repressed and damaged by sin and iniquity, but it's there. Even the most egregious, in, intentional, blasphemous sinner has that little bit of divine creation in them. And so we have to learn to be able to find the reason to extend grace and, and to look and to say, you know, as despicable as this person's behavior might be, they are a soul for whom Christ died. They were divinely created and they were placed on this earth for a purpose. Perhaps that purpose is to vex me, but they're put here for a purpose. And so we try to find ways to bring our passions under control uh, as pertains to even the most irritable of God's children. St. Isaiah the Solitary tells us, When the intellect grows strong, it makes ready to pursue the love that quenches all bodily passions and that prevents anything contrary to nature from gaining control over the heart. Then the intellect, struggling against what is contrary to nature, separates this from what is in accordance to nature. Uh, I have spoken... Um, before on the, when you are in that spiritual zone and it feels like nothing can bother you, you know, when you, once you've gotten there, you want to stay there. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, then that's got to be our first prayer for you is that 
you will come to experience that. It is hard, however, to maintain. It is extremely hard to maintain. Now, Evergreus uh, teaches that three demons are at the gateway. These are gluttony, avarice, and that which moves us to seek the favor of others. Gluttony and, and avarice, we've talked in, in other courses about subduing the flesh, about, about, you know, this is why we fast, this is, is to, to let the body know it doesn't always get what it wants. Avarice is, is greed and lust, okay, and those same things. We have to teach the body that it just can't always get what it wants. And then, of course, there is that last thing, the desire for the favor of others. Church leaders, we get attacked with this all the time. Oh, you just want to be popular. You just want butts in the seat and bucks in the plate. Well, I, I have no seats. So, you know, you know, it would be nice to have bucks in the plate. I won't kid you about that. But it's not why we do what we do here. Mega churches, they market Jesus Christ. There's actually a very famous uh, mega church preacher who said, I only preach the marketable aspects of the gospel. Lord have mercy on his soul. But we want to always in coming before the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, show me if this is about puffing up my ego, if this is about, uh, 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 about you know, making a name for myself, well then, Lord, you know, please remove that from me because I want to get recognition in heaven, um, not particularly not particularly interested in recognition on earth. And, and, I, and I think that that's true for um, most of our ministers. We, we, don't, we don't do what we do um, out of a sense of, of, of wanting to get wealthy. We don't do what we do out of a sense of... of, of uh, even wanting recognition for ourselves, we do want people to find and follow and learn from us uh, because narrow is the way and few there are that find it but it is not about um, earthly wealth for the staff and ministers of Kadesh Mishkan Ministry Group or the teachers of the Theological Seminary here. Every one of our ministers, our tent maker ministers, we do not, uh, we do not earn our living from the gospel. And I'm not down on somebody who can, I'm just saying we don't. Pray first for the purification of the passion, second for deliverance from ignorance and forgetfulness, and third for deliverance from all temptation, trial, and dereliction. I talked about this a little bit last week uh, on the subject of prayer. Uh, Evagrius the Solitary wrote a great deal on this subject. Purification of the passions, deliverance from ignorance and forgetfulness, and deliverance from all temptation, trial, and dereliction. In the West, uh, this concept of uh, uh, original sin has uh, has made its way into um, into the the, the uh, lexicon of the West. It, it, it's and you know this this uh, whole thing actually started in uh, when when. Uh, St. Jerome mistranslated Romans 5.12. And uh, he translated it as, In Adam all have sinned. And, and uh, because Augustine didn't read Greek, 
Uh, he relied on Jerome's trans mistranslation and created a theology of original sin and original guilt to match the mistranslation. And most modern translations of Scripture have removed this error. They have not, however, removed the error in theology. St. Mark the Ascetic writes, He who hates the passions gets rid of their causes. But he who is attracted to their causes is attacked by the passions even though he doesn't wish it. When evil thoughts become active within us, we should blame ourselves and not ancestral sin. Sins don't just magically manifest. First there is a temptation, then there is the entertaining of that temptation, and then the entertaining of that temptation becomes an idea or a plan for fulfilling that temptation, and then eventually we step into that sin. At every step of the way, we can have opportunities to pull back, to pull away, to reject. And yet in most cases, in many cases as pertains to habitual sin, we don't. And, or we will resist for a period and, and, and then say, oh, well, you know, I, it's been a year since I sinned this way. You know, maybe, maybe next time I'll get two years. And temptation in and of itself is not sin, by the way. Temptation is the enemy of our souls saying, well, let's see if this might be effective at side railing them. Well, let's try that thing. Oh, this didn't work. Well, how about this over here? Maybe um, seeking material wealth didn't work, but we can puff them up with fame. Let's try that. Fame didn't work. Let's try, you know, earthly greed or jealousy or, you know, whatever. And so temptation by itself is not sin. Entertaining temptation, entertaining temptation is the beginning of sin. And, and we see this, um, for the love of all of money is the root of all evil, the root of many kinds of evil. Well, money in and of itself, neither good nor bad. The love of money, on the other hand, and the avarice for all of the things that the money can, can, can bring, and right? Well, that's, that is the root of many, many kinds of sin. So it's the same as, as pertains to any of the passions. This same thing is true. That if we give ourselves a pass, but, oh, you know, ancestral sin, you know, everybody, everybody does that. Right? If we give ourselves a pass, then we aren't really dealing with the root issue. If we pretend that somehow or another this is an unbeatable thing, well, we make God out to be a liar because God said these things can be beat. Okay, He didn't say they were easy to beat. He said they can be beat. And so this is how we, we have to, to, to look at these temptations. And when we catch ourselves entertaining a temptation... You know, that's where we want to stop it. And so, as he said, somebody who truly hates the passions gets rid of their causes. A good one is the sin of lust as pertains to the television set. Television's neither good nor evil. But what you watch on TV can be a source of great temptation. It can be a source of great lust. It can be a source of jealousy and envy and 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 uh, all sorts of malignancy and so if you allow yourself to watch those things 
then you are entering into a, a, a covenant with the unholy. And you entertain this stuff. Uh, I, we have one young lady, she deals a great deal with people who struggle with demonic oppression. And in cases of demonic oppression, most of the time people don't say, okay, Satan, here I am, hail Satan, come get me. They, they don't do that. What most people do is they enter into implied consent situations. Well, I'm going to do this because I want the benefit of it. I'm going to do that because I want the benefit of it. It's very similar in a way um, to your user agreement on your smartphone or your computer. Um, how many people really go through and read the fine print? Most do not. We just say, okay, I agree because I want to use, you know, I want my phone to work, right? So we... We push the I agree. Well, the same sort of thing is true in demonic relationships. A lot of people enter into these relationships that fulfill some aspect of the passion without even recognizing that they've done so. You know, there's some things are really, really obvious, like Ouija boards and uh, uh, that kind of thing. Other things are a little more subtle. Regardless, we do this. Uh, passions of the flesh are the same way. You know, if I, if I put no unclean thing before my eyes, then that's going to help me to be less inclined to have that kind of iniquity thrust upon me. Now, if someone, for example... Um, Oh, if, you, if you're reading romantic novels and those romantic novels have, you know, 75 pages of explicit sex scenes in them and the next thing you know, you're dealing with uh, sexual temptation and lust and, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. you've implied consent by reading that material. Um, I've had people say to me, well, you know, you can't get so holy that you're no earthly good. Oh, yeah, I think I can, actually. I, I think that by being holy, we become good for the earth. We become earthly good in a way that most people don't even realize they need. You know, this world needs intercessors. It needs, it, it needs people to stand in the gap for, for the mercy of those who don't yet know to pray for themselves. You know, when I gave up politics, I had uh, a lot of people say, but you got to stay up on what's going on. Well, no, I really don't. I really don't. I look at the world in a sin condition... And I recognize that sin condition. I don't need to know which politician said what about who in order to address that sin condition. When we not only refrain from worldly actions, but no longer call them to mind, we have attained true tranquility says St. Nilus the ascetic. This gives the soul opportunity to look at the impressions previously stamped on the mind and to struggle against each one and illuminate it. As long as we go on receiving new impressions, our intelligence is occupied with them. And so it's not possible to r remove the early ones. In consequence, our struggle to eradicate the passion is inevitably far harder since these passions have become strong enough through being allowed to increase gradually, and now, like a river in full flood, they drown the soul's discernment with one fantasy after another. 
You see, you've got to shut off the flow of garbage in and deal with it in order to eventually stop pumping garbage out. Now, the world will tell you this can't be done, but the world lies. It can be done. It can be done. And there's a great deal of information here on the passions. And I, again, like so many of these things, I don't necessarily want to go into the particular ones because I don't want you to be telling you what you need to think about these things. I want them to speak to you individually where you are in the way that you are because that's what you, you know you are going to have to address things different than those things that I address. St. Theodorus does make a, an interesting uh, statement here though he says there are three principal passions through which all the rest arise love of sensual pleasure love of riches and love of praise. Close in their wake follows five other evil spirits, and from these five arise a great swarm of passions and all manners of evil. Thus he who defeats the three leaders and rulers simultaneously overcomes the other five and subdues their passions. Again, if we look at all of these things that come at us as one of three things, then we can, st and we attack them at the root cause, well then, we stand a chance, a better chance, a much better chance of, of, of defeating them. They can be defeated, but it takes effort. And it's worth the effort. It's, it's something that once we become a pure soul, freed from passions and constantly delight in divine love, a culpable passion is an impulse from the soul that is contrary to our godly nature. This passion is a peaceful condition of the soul in which the soul is not easily moved to evil. We want to get to a, 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 a position, a place, of serene indifference. We see what's going on, we identify it for what it is, but we don't get wrapped up in it, we don't get caught up in it, we don't get, uh, we don't allow it to drag us into evil. This is one of those spiritual things that is far, far easier said than done, but it can be done. And once we get to our point of serene indifference, we will find that the world will constantly be trying to drag us out of that place. And so we will then have to fight the passions to, to actually maintain our peace. But it becomes far, far easier to do. And why is this important, you might ask? Well, it's, it's important because, first of all, it's what Scripture demands. Uh, secondly, because we, as light and salt in the world, must be prepared to be the hands and the feet and, where necessary, the mouth of God. And in this generation, and if we are corrupted by this generation, well, it makes it, it makes our statements invalid. Um, uh, you know, all you really have to do is look at, at certain American ministers that tie their horses to a particular political party, a particular political ideology on either side of the spectrum, doesn't really matter. When they tie their horses to a political ideology, then they become hostage. Their credibility becomes hostage to the actions of that person. And if you then turn around and find out that the person is not you know, as advertised, and let's face it, there's 
this happens with politicians all the time, then the credibility of the minister has gone down the tubes. So if we can step back from this, uh, I, 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 I will say this about that as far as politics goes. God ordains good kings and bad kings alike. He sets them up according to his purposes. And we can look at any given king given to any country. We can look at any president, any, any leadership. And we can say, well, this is what God has decided our nation deserves in this moment. And then we pray and intercede for that person. Whether we would have voted for them or not is completely irrelevant. We pray for them that our nation might live in peace. Doesn't mean we endorse the person. Doesn't mean we, we don't endorse them. It just means we look at them as who God has put in power in this moment, we, we submit ourselves under the will of God. I was slightly amazed uh, in recent political discussion of all of the people professing believers who seemed to believe that God had somehow or another made a mistake in this election or the last one. Or, and, and, and that's ridiculous. God ordains who he feels we deserve. I'll say that again, who we deserve. And when we look at who we deserve, whether or not that's a good thing for America, yeah, up to God. Uh, and therein lies serene indifference. If I stay close to God, doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's in Congress, doesn't matter who's in Parliament. If I stay close to God, it works itself out. That's serene indifference. That's the goal, is to try to become dispassionate about the things of the world. Take them or leave them. Glad when I got them. When Paul said, you know, I'm glad when I've got good things, but I'm accustomed to when I don't. My happiness doesn't rise and fall on those things. Well, that's where we want to get. The whole purpose in controlling the passions is to let nothing knock us off of our relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to leave it there for today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and give you peace.